Uh, throughout his career, he's made uh, many profound advances in, in the understanding of how quantum mechanics can enrich the behavior of inter interacting many parts of the system. In some cases, his work has opened an entirely new field that uh, really beautifully transcends the existing theoretical framework. Uh, among many accolades, uh, Sanko currently holds a science investigator award and a research, research chair from Gregor Institute. He's also famous, incidentally, on a more personal note, for his unbounded uh, enthusiasm and energy, and together with his uh, assessing deep and visionary uh, thinking, which makes him always a joy to interact with both on a personal and scientific level. So today he's going to tell us about some recent efforts uh, trying to unravel one of the great mysteries in, in the field, namely developing a theory for what's called strange metal phases. Uh, with that, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming the introduction to our Thank you, Jason, for that uh, lovely introduction. And um, uh, yeah, and um, uh, that's a great pleasure to be here. It's been wonderful uh, to meet people I know, to meet people that I've never met before, and learn about all kinds of wonderful things that are happening at Caltech, at Caltech Physics. Hi, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this saw an old uh, friend of mine. Uh, all right, so uh, so the talk that I'm going to give is on strange quantum metals. I'll explain what these are as we go along. And there's a bunch of papers that I've written with uh, people that I'll also introduce uh, as we go along. Uh, so this is a colloquium on Kenneth's matter of physics. And I recognize that many people in this room uh, will not be convinced matter of physicists. So I want to start by asking people, uh, I think it doesn't work. Uh, um, I have a problem with the clicker. Uh, uh, I'm not able to move slides. <laughs> Ah, uh, mm -hmm. oh, I mean, sure. just, just do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, can I say a show of hands? Uh, how many people recognize this picture? Some number, maybe not all. Uh, so, uh, so this is a picture of a Fermi surface. It's the Fermi surface of copper, metallic copper. Uh, so it's always fun to look at shapes of Fermi surfaces. Uh, you know, if you just Google uh, the Fermi surface of some complicated material, uh, complicated element, metallic element, you'll see a very interesting looking surface, right? It's often not a simple sphere or anything like that. Uh, okay, so uh, it's going to be a talk about metals, uh, of understanding of metals. Uh, uh, so conventional metals, uh, things like copper, uh, we, we understand very well. And it's been known for a long time, for 100 plus uh, or order 100 years, that the electrons in a metal at ordinary temperatures should be regarded as a quantum fluid or fermions. Uh, in particular, the fact that electrons or fermions matters in getting started and understanding the properties of a metal. Uh, now, the effects of the electron-electron Coulomb repulsion, uh, it's also well understood that they are weakened considerably by the Pauli, Pauli exclusion principle that prevents two electrons of the same spin from coming too close to each other. Uh, or if you prefer to think in terms of momentum space, uh, no, a free Fermi gas has the property that it fills up a Fermi sphere, uh, the surface of which is the Fermi surface, and uh, states inside the Fermi surface are fully occupied and the interior of the Fermi surface, therefore, is quite inert. Right? There's, uh, that it has as many, it holds as many electrons as it possibly can. So you can't put extra stuff, extra electrons inside the Fermi surface. This means that if you consider electron electron scattering uh, for electrons near the Fermi surface, the phase space for scattering is greatly reduced because the interior of the Fermi surface is just taken out of the possible phase space into which electrons can scatter. Right? Uh, so uh, these states, these electron, electrons that live near the Fermi surface, 
uh, we, we call them quasi-particles. Uh, they're almost like particles, but they just weakly scatter off each other. Uh, and this picture of uh, 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 thinking about the electron just uh, dressed in some kind of way to form a quasi-particle inside uh, uh, a metal, uh, that describes conventional metals extremely well. Uh, and this one is uh, there in every textbook in solid state physics. And uh, uh, this theory for the description of a conventional metal was, uh, uh, it goes under the name of Landau's theory of forming liquids. Right? So it was developed, uh, the key ideas were developed by Landau in the 1950s, and it gave uh, the general basic justification for why we can more or less pretend uh, that the electrons inside a metal ca can be described as a free from gas uh, for many purposes. Okay. Uh, okay, so one of the simplest things that you can measure in the lab uh, uh, in Kenneth's matter of physics is the electrical resistivity. So if you measure the electrical resistivity of a conventional metal, it looks something like this. So there's the resistivity and there's the temperature. Uh, it will increase as you increase the temperature. Okay. Uh, now, if at zero temperature, zero Kelvin, there's there'll typically be some non-zero resistivity, and that resistivity comes from elastic scattering of electrons off of defects in the crystalline lattice. It could be impurities, it could be other kinds of crystal defects, so on and so forth. Right, and the temperature dependence of the resistivity comes from inelastic scattering of electrons of other moving parts in the solid. Could be other electrons, it could be lattice vibrations, cold phonons, and, and other things. So in situations where the electron-electron scattering dominates the inelastic scattering of electrons, right, uh, which need not always happen, but when it does. Uh, so then, uh, that, and particularly if it dominates the relaxation of electrical currents inside the metal, then the resistivity this temperature dependence is known to be quadratic. Okay, it goes like T squared, and uh, the, the low temperature resistivity looks something like this. And the reason it goes like T squared is a simple phase space argument. Uh, if you estimate the, uh, if you calculate the phase space for two electrons to scatter off each other in the presence of a Fermi surface, uh, so then and, and you just calculate the phase space for scattering, uh, you get this T squared factor. Okay, uh, so it's a good exercise for graduate students if they've not done it before to check that you indeed get T squared in the presence of a Fermi surface. Okay. Uh, okay, so this talk is not about conventional metals, it's about uh, weird metals uh, that we don't understand. They're called strange metals. Uh, like, yes, we could call them weird metals, but historically, people call them strange. And uh, they're strange because they're not Fermi liquids. Right? The, the Landau Fermi liquid theory, where you treat the electrons as being well behaved objects that form a Fermi surface, is uh, the textbook theory of metals. But these, uh, there's a class of metals that people have been discovering where, uh, where, where the standard Fermi liquid theory of metals uh, breaks down. And these are what are known as the strange metals. So these have been seen in experiments for more than 30 years now. Uh, and there's many, many sightings of these uh, kinds of metals that violate Fermi liquid theory. Some down to extremely low temperatures, temperatures that are much smaller than any of the intrinsic energy scales in the system. Okay? So the most prominent example of a strange metal is in the phase diagram of the copper-based high temperature superconductors, uh, which people call the cuprates. Uh, so you, you know, many of you have probably seen this phase diagram more times than you want to remember. Right? So this is the temperature and this is the density of electrons. Uh, and these materials start off as scintillators. And then as you increase the density, as you change the density of electrons, they become superconducting. But the key point uh, as far as this talk is concerned to note is that in most of this phase diagram, uh, uh, certainly, if you go above the superconducting transition temperature, uh, these are metals that do not seem to be described by Fermi liquid theory. Right? Uh, so it's a weird kind of metal out of which the superconductor emerges. So clearly, to declare victory on this old problem of high temperature superconductivity, 
uh, we, we have to come to terms with the stained metal phase, right? So that's the platform, that's the uh, stage on which high from which high temperature superconductivity emerges. So without understanding uh, this state, it's hard to know that we're really getting everything right about the superconductor. Okay, so then it's an important problem to try to come to grips with what's going on here. Now, uh, in the last 30 years, uh, many other systems, you see this known for liquid stain metal physics. If you take a metal and you tune it, uh, it's the specific kinds of metals if you tune it to the vicinity of a magnetic ordering transition at zero temperature, uh, which people can do, say, with application of pressure or by uh, other tricks. Uh, you again oftentimes see a strange metal. Uh, and many of you probably heard of uh, 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 magic angle twisted by Leah Griffin. Uh, Stephen Nudge-Perch uh, studies him experimentally here. And it's a lot of beautiful theory work as well at Caltech. So even in this system, which is sort of the latest uh, plaything for Phoenix matter physics, even here, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, evidence uh, uh, building up for some kind of stained metal physics that we don't really understand uh, at, at this point of time. Uh, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the uh, stained metal in these copper-based high temperature superconductors. That's the best studied stained metal. Uh, so I'll refer to these as cuprates, these uh, materials. So these cuprate materials have a sort of crystal structure where there are copper oxide copper oxygen planes on which the electrons primarily move. And it's a layered system. There's uh, multiple layers, you know, infinite number of layers of these copper oxygen planes. And between two copper oxygen planes, there's all kinds of stuff. That's where uh, the, in the example that I've shown this lanthanum and oxygen, the other materials in which you retain the same copper oxygen plane, but you put other things in between, you know, other elements in between. So there's a whole family of materials. What they all share in common is the copper oxygen plane. Okay. Uh, so you see all kinds of power loss when you measure, uh, make measurements in this region uh, in many physical quantities. Uh, and those power laws are very strikingly different from anything that is measured in a conventional metal. Okay. For instance, uh, uh, if you measure the resistivity in the copper oxygen plane, if you let currents go in the plane, and you measure the resistivity in the plane, the voltage drop in the plane, uh, and you plot that as a function of temperature, doesn't it all look like what I said in an earlier slide about a conventional metal? It looks very simple, but it looks different, right? Rather, it just looks linear all the way from about 10 Kelvin in this material out to about 700 or 800 Kelvin, okay? So the very striking simple behavior that, again, to this day, is not understood, okay? Uh, so the mystery of these stained metals is uh, widely recognized by those of us who've been working on, in this field to be one of the big challenges in quantum current spider physics. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, there's many, many questions that are raised by the observations on these stained metals, and we mostly don't have good answers to any of them. Okay. Uh, so one question that one could try to think about uh, is, you know, how generally, what's the general framework through which we can think about metals with no quasi particles? Uh, uh, so we could be interested in the nature of some coarse grained long wave then effective theory of such a metal. Uh, one advantage of having such a coarse grained description is that, uh, you know, that description will more or less wash away all kinds of microscopic details, and one may hope that that description captures a number of different stained metals, irrespective of which microscopic system it's realized in. Right? Uh, in much the same way as the Navier-Stokes equation describes a variety of fluids, irrespective of which atom uh, goes into making that fluid. Right? So we're seeking some analogous kind of story for a class, various classes of stained metals. Uh, Something's happening, but uh, so one hope. Uh, I don't think I can get rid of that in real time. So one hope 
uh, is that is to construct a low energy effective theory, uh, this coarse grain theory for, uh, uh, for for the same metal that captures its uh, universal properties, right? That uh, 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 so that's something that we could uh, try to want to do. Uh, so in charismatic physics, we'll often know to a reasonable extent the structure of what happens microscopically. Uh, for instance, uh, we know what the crystal structure is. We know that we have electrons moving on that lattice and they're interacting with each other, blah, blah, blah. We may not know the details of the Hamiltonian, but we'll know uh, uh, quite a bit ab about the microscopic uh, description of the system. And usually, uh, it's very hard to do any calculations directly on this microscopic description, uh, either analytically or numerically. Right? So we have no direct path. So we, we know the microscopic description, and we know the experiments. Right? We want to try to connect the two. And we usually won't have a, the ability to directly calculate on this to reach the kinds of things that people are measuring. Right? So having an effective theory uh, is some intermediate step that one hopes one can pull off. And it's got to be consistent with what we know about the microscopic uh, modeling. And it's also got to reproduce, to produce for us the kinds of things that people measure in experiments, right? And the hope here is that uh, if we construct a good low energy effective theory, uh, then irrespective, uh, then a, a different classes of microscopic systems can all be described by very similar or maybe the same effective theory, but perhaps with different parameters. Much the same way as in Navier-Stokes, you may have different values of the compressibility and the viscosity, but the same equations describe all fluids, right? Uh, okay, uh, so this is something people have been trying to do for a long time. Uh, I said this is an old problem. Uh, uh, for prominent stain metals, for instance, in these cuprate systems, we have no idea what the structure of this effective theory uh, could be, right? Uh, uh, we don't even know what the relevant low energy degrees of freedom are. We know what the microscopic degrees of freedom are. They're electrons moving in a lattice with strong interactions, right? Uh, but uh, we really, at this point of time, you know, 35 years uh, uh, of work on the speed, we have no idea uh, how to formulate what degrees of freedom go into formulating a useful effective theory. Uh, so there are many ideas over the years. Uh, people have played around with trying to say that maybe the electrons, we should really write a theory in terms of electrons near a Fermi surface coupled to some critically fluctuating uh, order parameter for some uh, uh, state. Uh, more exotic ideas say that maybe the electron splits into different objects uh, and then there's a, there's a description of uh, the resulting state in terms of uh, what in charismatic physics we call emergent gauge fields. Uh, that's, uh, so then we have no idea, you know, exactly what kind of emergent gauge field you should have. You know, should you describe the system in terms of uh, you know, theory that like in Maxwell electromagnetism has U1 gauge fields or something like in QCD or something like that. So it almost feels like this total freedom for theorists to do whatever they want, right? And it's not clear whether any of that is correct or successful. Uh, it, it, it's clear whether it's successful or it's not clear whether it's correct. Right? Uh, there are even ideas uh, uh, trying to describe this kind of state by using ideas coming from string theory. Uh, uh, some of you may have heard words like holography and so on, say that it's somehow described by a gravity theory in one higher dimension and so on and so forth. So there's a whole host of ideas, but uh, none of these have had much success in terms of describing what actually goes on in real materials or real experiments, even qualitative. Right? Uh, so given the state of affairs, and it's entirely possible that the, the right uh, solution to formulating a useful effective theory of the stained metal will come from a completely different direction from any of the ideas that people have explored so far. Okay, so that's sort of the state of ignorance that we have in the field right now. 
right? Uh, uh, so given the state of affairs, a question that we can ask ourselves is what can we do that will constitute reliable progress? Right? Something solid that we can say uh, without adding one more speculation to this list of things that have already been tried. Right? So that's going to be what motivates the rest of my talk. So I'm going to start with some ideas that are inspired by experiments. Right? Uh, so I'm going to call them assumptions or central dogmas. Fortunately, this, uh, let me see if I can get rid of it. Uh, yeah, I think that works. Uh, so I'll make three assumptions about a class of strain metals. And uh, I'll read them out first, and then I'll give you some justification of them. And then we'll see, uh, we'll develop some story based on assuming these three uh, statements. Uh, so the first assumption, the first dogma, uh, is going to be that the essential physics of the same metal is that of a clean system. Right? So what that means in practice is that you know any solid that anybody makes always has some impurities or other defects in it. So the statement here is that uh, that the presence of those impurities is not essential uh, in developing an understanding of the phenomena associated with the same metal. Okay, they're there, but uh, they give you some uh, higher order effects. Uh, so the second assumption is that the same metal is scale invariant. Uh, so this is already indicated by the power laws that are seen in many different quantities. The power law is a classic indicator of something that's scale invariant. Uh, in particular, if you look at the dynamics of the system, uh, how things change in time, uh, there's no intrinsic energy scale for the dynamics. So if you're at a temperature T, the only scale for the frequency is set by uh, the temperature itself. It's set by KVT over H bar. Okay. And uh, the third dogma is that uh, the stained metal is compressible in the sense that the physics of the stained metal is not restricted to any particular density that uh, uh, is such that the charge can lock to the underlying crystalline lattice. Uh, uh, um, uh, that you can tune the density continuously in the same, the charge density continuously in the stained metal phase without affecting the physics of the stained metal. Okay. Uh, so why these dogmas is, let me address why I make uh, these particular assumptions in the next few slides. The first statement is that it's, uh, as I'll argue, it's extremely well motivated by experiments on some of the best studied stained metal phases. Okay, uh, uh, for instance, in these tube plates, these copper based high temperature superconductors. Uh, on the theoretical side, it's also this, these assumptions are also very interesting to make theoretically because they are fairly mild assumptions about what can constrain the theory of the same metal. But nevertheless, these mild assumptions are such that they impose very strong constraints on the structure of the effective theory that for the same metal, right? Uh, so you end up learning quite a bit, right? Uh, so in particular, uh, you limit the search for an explana explanation to a narrow range of possible theories. You still won't get a full answer, but it'll be a stick to die. Just one last question. Yeah, yeah it's, coming, it's coming in the next few slides. That's gonna be what I'll spend, a, I'll spend more time on the first assumption than the other two assumptions. All right, so uh, uh, let, let me give you some justification, empirical justification for these dogmas. Let me start with the first one, which is perhaps the most non-trivial assumption that uh, I'll make, uh, that the essential physics does not involve disorder at all. Okay, for that, I'll have to show you some data. Uh, so one thing I've learned over the years is that when a Kenneth Smiley person talks to non Kenneth Smiley people, it's easy to lose the audience if you show too much data. So I'll try to limit the data that I showed to just making the point that I want to make. Right? If you are curious about a lot more, then you know, come to Kenneth Smiley seminars. Right? So let's look at transport in the Kipling statement. As I said, this is the best studied system, so there's a lot of data 
on the cuprate stain metals. This famous old data on uh, one of the cuprates. So there's many families of cuprates. So this in one family. And near where the TC is maximal, you see a nice linear and temperature behavior. I already showed this uh, plot. Here's on some other cuprate and this on yet another cuprate. And in some of these systems, it's possible to kill the fibrinatory of the magnetic field and see what happens to the linear T resistivity down to essentially zero temperature. That's done here. This data was taken in the magnetic field and the linearity goes down to about two Kelvin while the underlying energy scales in the problem are at least 1,500 Kelvin, right? So I think uh, it's a good indication that this really is a zero temperature property of the system. Uh, and it's usually masked by a superconductor. curve, but if you can remove the superconductor, curve, you will see it. So the linear T resistivity is seen in every cuprate, right? Uh, um, okay, down to very low temperature. Uh, now the residual resistivity, uh, the one that's due to elastic scattering of impurities, that is extremely small. Uh, for this data, this is one of the cleanest cuprates. So I can just draw a straight line uh, on keynote very easily, right? And extrapolate it backwards and it extrapolates to zero, right? Uh, and so the other materials, it doesn't quite extrapolate to zero, but you see that the linear part of the resistivity very quickly becomes bigger than the residual resistivity, right? Uh, uh, so this suggests that perhaps this order is not essential to the basic physics. The residual resistivity is one indicator of how strong the disorder is. And it seems like disorder doesn't seem to play that much of a big role. Now, there's another kind of evidence that uh, has been around for a while, uh, though people hadn't uh, looked at it, that, that, you know, taken the right message from it. Uh, so you can look at the slope of the linear resistivity. And you have to normalize it by the number of uh, layers that you have to look at the resistivity per copper oxygen layer, but that you can do knowing the crystal structure, right? Uh, so you look at the slope of the linear resistivity. Uh, it turns out it's almost the same for different whole dope cuprates. Uh, so the, the whole dope is a technical term, God, God, ignore that. For, for different of these cuprates, I pulled this out of some fairly recent paper, though similar observations had been made a long time back. If you look at the slope, it's basically the same in all these different materials. So these are materials where the stuff that's in between the copper oxygen planes is completely different. They're grown by different groups, different methods of growth. But the fact that the slope is the same, it's almost certain that they come with different levels of disorder, right? It's hard to imagine that different people making samples in different places in the world will magically have exactly the same disorder, right? So the slope seems to be independent of which material within the cuprate family you look at, and therefore, that's another indicator that it doesn't care about the strength of disorder that you have, right? Uh, so finally, there's a very interesting but obscure uh, experiment that was reported uh, uh, many, many years back. Uh, so this again on one particular cuprate material known as YBCO, a prominent cuprate. So what they did here is to take this material and subject it to electron irradiation. Right? So as the electron goes through the sample, it leaves behind some tacks. And that's a very gentle way to change the amount of disorder in the system. And then the remaining electrons, uh, the electrons that are already there in the sample, they scatter off these tacks. And that then increases the amount of disorder in the system. By increasing the exposure time to irradiation, uh, you can gently change the amount of disorder that exists in the system. Right? And what you see is that the slope of this linear resistivity doesn't change, but the intercept changes, right? These different curves, they're not curves, they're different straight lines, just move parallel to each other, right? So you're changing the residual resistivity by changing the disorder as you expect to, but you're not changing the slope of the linear resistivity, okay? So linear, the slope of the linear resistivity seems to not care about the disorder that's there, okay? So all of these together, motivate the assumption that the essential physics of the same metal can be understood by thinking about a model with uh, lattice translation symmetry, uh, a, a model of electrons on a clean lattice, uh, and worry about disorder as some higher order effect 
if you want to understand the residual resistivity. Okay. Uh, so and so on. That, that's the reason for making the assumption of P. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, very good. So, so what happens in these materials is that the uh, where the dopant atoms sit, they don't sit in the copper oxygen plane. They sit outside of the plane. So that then mitigates the effect of disorder. You get a smooth random potential. And the electrons, they do see it. They, they do have some residual resistance. But as I showed in one of these cuprates, the residual resistivity can be very small, even zero. Okay. So the the temperature dependent part doesn't seem to care about that very much. So disorder is there, but it doesn't seem to be important. That's the statement. Okay. Um, okay. So let me then go to the second dogma that is scale invariant. In particular, I want to talk about no intrinsic frequency scale, and the scale is just set by KBT over H bar. So one way to interrogate this kind of statement is to measure some quantity as a function of frequency at different temperatures, and then see if the only scale for frequency is KBT over H bar, right? And this is easiest to do by measuring again the conductivity uh, or the resistivity at the AC, the, you know, the frequency dependent conductivity, measure optical transport, right? And pe again, people have been doing this for a long time, and uh, uh, there's some representative data from this paper from 2003. Uh, so there's all kinds of structure in the frequency dependent conductivity uh, as a functional uh, uh, conductivity on this axis, frequency on this axis. You can try to scale the low energy, low frequency part of this data as these people did. And at least out to about 1.5 times temperature, the data could have a reasonable scaling collapse where you see that the scale for the uh, frequency dependence is set by the temperature itself. There's something else that happens at higher frequency that's not very well understood. That's this tail. Uh, but this tail really goes out to very high energies for the order of uh, uh, microscopic energy scales that all hell breaks loose. Uh, so it's not clear what that has to do with any, uh, uh, anything in the low frequency limit. Now, uh, so this is from 2003. So with, much more recently, there was a, a, a nice measurement trying to establish the same thing in one of the other stain metal systems that have also been studied a lot. Uh, uh, these are in uh, uh, certain kinds of, uh, 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 in this material, uh, uh, which has all kinds of interesting stain metal physics. And uh, there's a measurement of the optical conductivity. Uh, and here you see much better scaling uh, if you plot the uh, real part of the conductivity times the power of temperature versus omega over t. And the data all collapse into a single plot, which again suggests that the only scale for frequency is set by KBT over H bar. Okay. Uh, uh, th th there are more recent experiments addressing this as well. But uh, as I said, I don't want to overwhelm people with data. So I'll uh, just flash these two. Uh, experiments. So the third assumption that I made that it's compressible, meaning it's not tied to any specific charge density, is not really doubted by any anybody working in this problem. Uh, uh, so that you can uh, one kind of experiment that uh, directly addresses this is to see if you can tune the charge density at which the stain metal appears by applying pressure or something to the system, and that was done fairly recently, you know, four or five years back. And indeed, you can tune it by applying pressure. Right? So there's nothing specific about the density at which the stained metal phenomenon appears. OK, so in the rest of the talk, I'll take these dogmas as uh, granted and ask about the constraints that follow on the low energy theory. OK, so that's going to be the, uh, uh, the focus of the talk. Uh, I'll almost show no further data. Right. And let's just try to do theory based on these assumptions. Okay, so the, I'm going to talk and think about electrical transport because that's the best studied, e most easily measured quantity. And uh, so there's something that uh, anybody who's thought seriously about electrical transport has uh, knows. Uh, 
That transport depends, uh, is determined quite crucially by what conservation laws you have in the system. Okay. Uh, so in general, to have for any system to have an electrical resistivity, you need a mechanism for electrical currents to relax. Okay. Now, if the electrical current can mix with some conserved quantity in the system, right, maybe it triggers a change in the value of some conserved quantity, then maybe the, the presence of that conserved quantity prevents the electrical current from relaxing. Okay. Uh, so one way to think about this is imagine you take your solid and you supply to it the voltage pulse, right? an electrical field that's some almost delta function at time t equals zero. And then you ask what current it sets off, right? So the current will lag behind, it will develop some response. And the question is whether the current at late times, uh, J infinity is zero or non-zero, right? Uh, so if the current is not zero, that means the current hasn't quite been able to relax long after the pulse was turned off, right? The electrical pulse was turned off, right? Uh, uh, so if it goes to zero, then you do have a mechanism for current relaxation, right? So the current doesn't relax. So if J infinity is non-zero, then you know that you must, you can't quite have a resistivity in the system, right? Uh, so this Caltech, uh, you know, uh, everybody knows Fourier transforms, can do Fourier transforms in their head. So a good homework problem, particularly if you're a student, is to take the Fourier transform of this picture, this is in the time domain, and ask what it implies in the frequency domain, right? Uh, and the claim is that uh, if J infinity is non-zero, then the real part of the conductivity, you know, the dissipator part of the conductivity has a delta function at zero frequency. That's basically telling you that there's no DC resistance, right? That omega equals zero, the conductivity is infinity, okay? Well, which is intuitive, but I encourage you to do the Fourier transform and convince yourself of this. So J infinity, the fact if J infinity is non-zero, that means that you push the system by hitting it with this electrical pulse, you push the system into a new equilibrium state where it's carrying a non-zero current, okay? Uh, so this J infinity is some equilibrium current and its value is determined by some thermodynamic susceptibility. So you can work it out in terms of you can work out the exact expression for J infinity in terms of susceptibilities of this, uh, uh, any conserved quantities that might exist in the system. So this story is actually very familiar in textbook solid state physics. It's familiar in Fermi liquids, which have a conserved momentum. And it's known that you can't get a DC resistance in a Fermi liquid, which has a conserved momentum. Uh, so the low temperature conductivity of a clean Fermi liquid uh, is determined entirely by processes that manage to relax the momentum of the Fermi fluid, right? So these processes uh, may come from impurities, or if you don't have impurities, they come from processes that transfer uh, momentum from the electrons to the lattice, okay? Uh, now in more general examples, uh, maybe not just the Fermi liquid, the current will overlap with all conserved quantities that have the same symmetry as the current. Right? So long as no symmetry reason forbidding such a mixing, there will be, the current will mix. And these will typically lead to uh, a delta function contribution to the real part of the conductivity, meaning no DC resistance. Okay. Uh, now in the strange metal, uh, empirically, we know that uh, this dogma too says it's scale invariant and we seem to have this omega over T scaling. Uh, this means, uh, so there's no intrinsic energy scale in the low energy theory. Uh, so the low energy physics is then that of a scale invariant theory plus some perturbations that could perhaps break the scale invariance. But those perturbations uh, by definition are unimportant as you go to lower and lower energies. So strain metal transport is a property of the scale invariant theory itself because it's part of the structure that has this omega over t scaling. And it's not determined by these perturbations that break the scale invariance of the theory. Okay, so it's part of the scale invariant structure uh, that uh, the linear resistivity is part of the scale invariant structure. So in particular, the implication is that the scale invariant theory has no delta function conductivity 
And it's all coming entirely from uh, 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 the scale invariance is coming from this other part, uh, which uh, has nothing to do with, with this uh, delta function. Right? This delta function is just absent. So unlike in a standard method, the implication is that things like this linear resistivity are not determined by the slow relaxation of nearly conserved quantities, but is instead uh, an intrinsic property of a scale invariant low energy theory. Okay, so we learn at least one big difference from, a from electrical transport in a standard method. So given the importance of conservation laws for transport, and given that conservation laws are related to uh, symmetries in the system. Let me talk a little bit uh, about global symmetries uh, in uh, many body physics. So we have some UV theory that will have some global symmetry that's described by some group, GUV. And uh, we're interested in this effective theory, this uh, which I'll call the IR theory, which will have global symmetry uh, uh, described by some other group, GIR, right? And I'm going to be interested in situations where the GUV is not spontaneously broken in the infrared, in the low energy theory. Uh, uh, and I want to be able to say something about this, uh, the internals, about the global symmetry group, GAR. Now, GUIR may be a bigger symmetry group than GUV. That's what, that's a familiar phenomenon. It's what's, uh, the, that's the notion of emergent symmetry at low energies. That's Symmetry that's there in the low energy theory that's not there in the microscopic theory. Uh, now, there's a subtle property of this emergent uh, low energy symmetry, GAR. Uh, it, uh, and that property is familiar in quantum field theory. It's known as an atoms anomaly. And uh, this something, if it's there, it can be constrained by this UV theory. Now, these anomalies. Uh, have increasingly become important in discussions of finished matter physics in the last 10 years. Uh, their topological properties of how symmetries realize in the state of matter uh, and they're robust to deformations within the same phase of matter. Right? So th thinking about these anomalies gives a direct connection between studies of things like these same metals and studies of topological matter that many finished matter physicists are engaged in uh, have been engaged in for the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. Um, okay. Uh, so the UV theory that I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, very simple. I have a lattice model of electrons at some filling. Uh, let me call it new for unit cell and D dimensions. And the symmetries of charge conservation, uh, obviously a symmetry of electrons and lattice translation because of my dogma that uh, I need to talk about a clean system. So not specify the Hamiltonian other than to require that it is local, meaning it's a sum of terms that's defined on, on, on neighboring sites. Uh, so this includes almost all the models that we think about in finished matter physics. Uh, it will not include a class of models that are very popular in recent years in this field. Uh, they have Kitai's name attached to them. Uh, they call the such the Kitai models. So what I'm going to say will have nothing to, uh, will not be relevant to those models, but those models have strong disorder and I'm explicitly ruling out strong disorder in any case, right? Uh, and microscopically, those models are very far away from uh, where the real materials are. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about how lattice translations can be realized in the IR theory. Right? In the UV, we know what a lattice translation is. You go from one lattice site to the next site. Now, in the low energy theory, we're imagining some sort of coarse grain description that washes over the microscopic details. Right? The low energy theory, uh, one might imagine then that an, a unit lattice translation in the microscopic theory is implemented in the after coarse grain as an infinitesimal translation of the IR theory. Right? Uh, because you've coarse grained and with the resolution that you have for the low energy theory, you don't resolve the lattice space. Uh, so that's a bit uh, imprecise. And the more precise statement is that uh, uh, we should also allow for an action by a, an internal symmetry of the low energy theory. And this very clearly demonstrated if you take uh, an example familiar in statistical mechanics of say the, uh, uh, an icing antiferromagnet on a 2D square lattice. Uh, it has some uh, uh, 
you know, spin soldering antiferromagnetically. You tune it to the finite temperature uh, uh, ordering transition. And uh, one of the things one learns in SATMEC uh, in grad school is that uh, an effective theory of the system near criticality is uh, a, a field theory that is very familiar in, uh, 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 to everybody. It's the continuum uh, five to the four theory with the real scale of field. And lattice translations are realized by taking the field five, which is the order parameter for the icing antiferromagnet, to minus of itself, right? Because under a unit lattice translation, the, the, the spin flips its orientation, right? So that is an internal symmetry of the spider of the fourth theory. Okay. Uh, so maybe some caveats to that, but I'll not uh, go into that for now. So there's a very simple example of the kind of constraints that uh, I'm thinking, uh, which is familiar probably to all physicists. So if I assume that the IR theory is fully gapped and is smoothly connected to a band insulator, and it's basically the same as a band insulator. Now we know that this possible only the UV theory has a filling U, which is an even integer, right? So there's the statement that band insulators need an even number of electrons for unit set. And, and note that this statement is a Hamiltonian independent statement, right? So I don't need to know what the Hamiltonian is. I just know that this statement is true, right? Uh, so it's this kind of statement, Hamiltonian independent statements that I'm seeking. Uh, so there's another famous example of this kind of statement uh, in kind of physics that's known as Ledinger's theorem uh, in Fermi liquids and it informs many discussions uh, of in the physics of metals. And it's a statement that the volume of the Fermi surface in a Fermi liquid is fixed by the electron density in much the same way as it is in the free Fermi gas, okay? And this statement was proven originally by Ledinger in the 1960s and given a topological interpretation uh, much later by Oshikawa. And this statement is also Hamiltonian independent and it's true so long as the ground state is a Fermi, uh, is a Fermi liquid, okay? Uh, so one of the things that we did in starting to think about this problem along these lines in the last few years is to give a modern viewpoint on Ledinger's theorem. Uh, we understand that now that Ledinger's theorem is a consequence of some deeper structure that's associated with the Fermi liquid, deeper theoretical structure. And the deeper theoretical structure is the emergent symmetry and this property that I call the anomaly of the low energy theory of a Fermi liquid. Okay. And then what we do is to generalize this deeper structure and hence let, uh, as a uh, sub result, Ledinger's theorem, to, a, to non Fermi liquid metals. Uh, where we don't have the, uh, uh, the understanding that Fermi liquid theory provides, right? So we obtain some Hamiltonian independent constraint on the possible structure of non Fermi liquid metals in clean systems. Uh, I'm running a bit short of time, so let me uh, skip some slides, but uh, let, let me illustrate how this works in one space dimension. And then I may just uh, skip to the uh, to the to, to one of the punchlines. Okay, so let's talk about metals in one space dimension where we are on completely solid footing. There's almost nothing that we don't understand about one D metals, but let's try to pretend that we don't understand most of the things we understand, and see whether we can abstract. We can reason in a way where we don't know what the Hamiltonian is, okay? Uh, so if you have three fermions at non-zero density in one dimension, perhaps moving on a lattice, they'll have some dispersion. And all the important action happens near the two Fermi points, uh, near the right Fermi point and the left Fermi point. And if you linearize the dispersion near these two Fermi points, you get a low energy theory for the 1D metal, which is a free massless Dirac fermion in one plus one dimension, okay? Now you can add interactions to the system and we know exactly what it does. Uh, now let's ask about the global uh, symmetry of this low energy theory of a 1D metal, right? Uh, so you have separate conservation of the number of electrons at each of these two Fermi points, right? Uh, so theorists like to say that there's a U1 cross U1 global symmetry, one U1 for the right mover and one U1 
for the left mover. Okay. Now the total charge of the system is simply the sum of the number of left moving electrons, and the number of right moving electrons. Right. If you're sitting only at low energies, that's all you've got. Now the total momentum, on the other hand, is the Fermi momentum times the difference of the number of right moving and left moving electrons. Okay. Uh, okay. So I haven't explained what this word normally means, but I can explain it through this uh, a simple example, right? Uh, in the, uh, this example. And normally is something that's very familiar, very easy to understand coming from condensed matter physics. Imagine you turn on an electric field in, for this 1D metal. So then you'll have a flow of electrons uh, from left uh, in momentum space from left to right. Right? So the entire Fermi C will drift in the direction of the electric field. And what that means is that you no longer have separate conservation of the number of left movers and the number of right movers. Rather, you have a transfer of charge from the left Fermi point to the right Fermi point. Okay? Uh, uh, so that's an, an example of an anomaly. Uh, it's perhaps the most famous example of the anomaly. Uh, and it tells you that the extent of non-conservation of left moving and right moving currents is proportional to the applied electric field. So the anomaly is a statement that there's a symmetry that's present, but that symmetry is violated in the presence of external gauge fields that couple to that symmetry. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so now let's do something very simple. Uh, let's ask about the implications of turning on an electric field on this system, right? Uh, in the UV theory, we know how the momentum changes in response to the electric field. It's just given by Newton's law. So the rate of change of momentum is proportional to the electric field and the total number of particles, total momentum, right? Uh, so that's, uh, I guess everybody understands that. So let's try to reproduce this result by thinking about the low energy theory of the 1D metal, right? So in the low energy theory, uh, the momentum, if you remember, is uh, the Fermi momentum times the difference of the number of right movers and left movers. And the rate of change of this difference is given precisely by the anomaly equation, right? So consequently, uh, the rate of change of momentum calculated in the low energy theory is this quantity. And that in turn, by the anomaly equation is given by this uh, expression, right? So now we want these two things to be equal to each other. So comparing these two expressions gives us an ex uh, a relationship between the Fermi momentum and the particle density, which is precisely the linear scale, right? So this is how the emergence of this U1 cross U1 symmetry and its anomaly ties in uh, with Lerner's theorem, okay? Uh, yeah, so this story can be generalized to two dimensions, uh, to two dimensional Fermi liquids. Uh, uh, so I won't dwell on this very much because I don't have much time. But you know, if you take a Fermi liquid in two dimensions, it has a huge symmetry. Uh, the number of quasi particles at each point on the Fermi surface is separately conserved. So you can make this into a precise statement about the low energy symmetry of the Fermi liquid. And just like in the one dimensional example, this symmetry is an anomaly. If you turn on an electric field, the entire Fermi surface shifts in the direction of the electric field. So you no longer have separate conservation of quasi particles at each point of the Fermi surface. More entertainingly, if you turn on a magnetic field, then uh, the quasi particle moves around chirally on the Fermi surface. It's just the V cross B force. So once again, you see that the symmetry of separate conservation of uh, particles on each point of the Fermi surface is violated. So there's an anomaly, there's an emergent symmetry and there's an anomaly of that emergent symmetry uh, in the two dimensional Fermi liquid as well. And by building on this and writing down the appropriate anomaly equations, you can show that Leringer's theorem follows as a consequence. The, the volume of the Fermi surface is fixed by understanding this emergent symmetry and anomaly. All right, so let me not describe how that works. Let me, just move on. Uh, so we can do that, and that's uh, we understood that. But let me talk about how we can generalize this beyond Fermi liquids, right? Uh, so we have a number of results. So I'll just uh, flash one result that we have without really explaining it. And the result is that uh, if 
if all we assume is that the ground state is compressible, so it's a metal at some generic density that preserves charge conservation symmetry and lattice translation symmetries, uh, then the low energy theory must have some extra emergent conserved quantities, which furthermore are anomalous, meaning their conservation law is violated if I turn on an external electromagnet. In other words, the structure of the emergent symmetry and anomaly that characterizes familiar 1D and 2D metals generalizes to a general non Fermi liquid, even if other statements about the Fermi liquid do not generalize. Okay? Uh, so this uh, anomaly then guarantees that the electrical current will mix with these con conserved quantities. Okay, So that, again, is something that I'm not really explaining, but th these are some of the results that we've been able to show. Okay, so now I can wind down on the talk by putting together the various things that I've talked about and showing that there's a contradiction, <laughs> almost a contradiction, right? So that's, I think, the real power of these assumptions. The, they are mild assumptions, but when you try to put them all together, they, something has to give, right? Uh, so let me return to my three dogmas. Now, dogmas one and three, clean and compressible, is what I've talked about in the last 15 minutes. They constrain the emergent symmetries and anomalies of any metal, whether or not it's from you. Okay? Now, dogma two is what I talked about before that, and it constrains transport in strain metals. Right? We saw that transport is not related to the slow relaxation of conserved quantities, unlike in a normal metal. So now, it seems like we have a problem. Right? Uh, so the statement that the stain metal transport is intrinsic uh, came from saying that there's this omega over T scaling. So it's uh, no delta function in the DC, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the conductivity, there is a DC resistance. But on the other hand, we also see that stain metal has emergent conserved quantities with which the current, the electrical current overlaps, right? Uh, and it was precisely this overlap of the electrical current with the conserved quantity that gives you this infinite DC conductivity, right? Uh, so how can these two statements be compatible with each other, okay? So there's only one way in which these two statements can be compatible, and that one way is the following. So I said that the current at infinite times following an electric pulse is, a, is determined by some thermodynamic susceptibilities. So I can work out what the susceptibility is, and it turns out that, so in other words, this weight of this delta function uh, has a numerator and a denominator. The numerator is a number that's fixed entirely by the anomaly uh, that we can prove must exist. So then the only way you can get rid of this delta function is by having the denominator blow up, right? So if the denominator diverges, then you get rid of this delta function and you have a possibility of having intrinsic transport without, that doesn't rely on relaxation of conserved quantities in a metal, okay? So what are these quantities with a diverging susceptibility, okay? Uh, so on general grounds, we know that uh, these operators, these conserved quantities must have the same symmetry as the electrical current. Otherwise they can't possibly mix with each other, right? Uh, this means that these observables must be or like the electrical current, they must be odd in the time reversal and inversion. Uh, they must have zero crystal momentum and they must transform as a vector under lattice rotations. Okay? So we understand the symmetry of the observable whose susceptibility must diverge. Right? Now, amazingly, these are the same symmetries as an order parameter that's been discussed a lot in the last 15 years in the cuprate materials. They're what's known as the Verma loop current order. They have circulating loop currents within each unit cell. And these kinds of currents were advocated for many years by Sandra Verma for completely different reasons, right? Uh, to understand other parts of the phase diagram and so on. And there's many reports of these kinds of currents uh, in a certain region of the Kipriot phase diagram as static ordered currents. And there's equal number of uh, reports debating these, these claims. Right? Like with many, many other things in the cuprates, the experimental situation is, a, is fairly controversial at this stage. Right? Uh, but nevertheless, there are indications of, for the existence of these currents. 
So we come from a completely different angle. We don't even assume a Hamiltonian in the system. There's some general arguments. And we are led to a, to a rationale for the existence of our, not necessarily of static loop current order, but at least of critically fluctuating loop current order in the stage metal. Right? So we're able to extract some concrete statement for experiments in this very general model independent uh, way that just focuses on some general constraints. All right, with that, let me stop. Uh, so the statement is that by making some general assumptions on the symmetries of the microscopic system that are important, we're able to reach some very strong constraints of the low energy theory that must be satisfied by any future, future correct theory of this phenomenon, right? Uh, uh, so we've extracted some results for experiments from thinking along these lines. Maybe there's more that we can extract or maybe not, right? So it's an open question how far we can go without committing to any particular dynamical model. But the strength of this approach is that, uh, you know, whatever we do, if we're not making some technical mistake, should be a solid result that constrains any future theory. Okay, for that, let me stop and introduce my wonderful collaborators. Uh, so Dominic Kels was a postdoc with us at MIT. So faculty at Perimeter, uh, uh, um, you know, played an absolutely crucial role in our collaboration. So uh, many of you may know Ryan Pongren, who was an undergrad here, and he wrote some beautiful papers with Anton Kapustin. Uh, he was an undergrad. Uh, uh, Zheng Yanshi is my current student at MIT, and Hart Goldman is a postdoc, and we continue to explore all these things. Uh, so thanks very much for your attention. Time for some questions. Actually, I had to log off on on, on Zoom. There are questions also maybe that you can. Um, maybe I'm logged off of Zoom as well. <laughs> no, I am screen sharing. Uh, back to meeting. Does that mean it was not? Stop share. Oh. Uh, nope. Well, maybe I, I can start. I have a couple questions. Um, first, uh, um, you know, armed with this intuition that there's some kind of loop current uh, fluctuating order parameter, can you now just try to build some phenomenological theory that couples electrons to that order parameter? And, and... Yeah, you can. That doesn't give you anything interesting. So we've done that. Um, and so clearly, that alone cannot be what's going on. Right? That has a, we mean, you know, if you just look at the phase diagram of the materials, it's clear that that alone cannot explain most of the things that are going on. Uh, but it can't even explain the strain metal. Right? Uh, we worked it out and it doesn't. Right? But yeah, so something else is also going on. But there's at least one thing that we've been able to wring out of these very general considerations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, e experimentally, yeah. Right. So, so if I go back to the um, phase diagram, um, yeah. So in this region, uh, em empirically, people see a closed full Fermi surface. So the Fermi arcs you're referring to is what happens when you go into the pseudo gap region, right? Uh, that very little is understood about these Fermi arcs, right? If you ask most theorists who try to think about this problem, people say, oh, it must somehow be that the Fermi arc has a backside that the experimentalists are not seeing for some reason. If you ask most experimentalists photo emission, you know, people who do, who report these Fermi arcs, they tell you that They've never seen the backside. Right? So it's hard to know what's going on. Uh, now, one thing I can say is that uh, if you assume something about the emergent symmetry and anomaly of this pseudo gap metal, 
Uh, so if, you, if it continues down to zero temperature, then you can prove that this Fermi arc behavior is impossible, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so it may be that the Fermi arc is a thermal property that uh, it's just there because you have some finite temperature effect. It's not a zero temperature state. Uh, sorry. If you make some assumptions about the structure of the anomaly, right, which and perhaps so it raises a question: Is there any emergent symmetry in anomaly that's compatible with the com, com, with the filling constraint that will also admit the possibility of a Fermi arc? We don't know the answer to the question, but. That's again a line of thought, which perhaps is what is, you know, we are capable as a community, capable of pursuing and answering. Right? Yeah. 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 I wonder if there's, um, we were assuming basically a clean description and assuming that that's valid all the way down to arbitrarily low energy. Yeah. Is it, does the job somehow become perhaps a little bit easier if you allow for the possibility that uh, this order is playing a role at, let's say, you know, some very small energy scale, but that this sort of is not the generator of strange metal behavior at higher energies? Yeah, no, that certainly is going on because as you saw, the, there is a residual resistivity, uh, right, in, for instance, in this whole data. Uh, but this linear part very quickly goes above that. Um, or if you go here, um, uh, Okay, here there's almost no residual history. But in many of these cases, there is a, eventually, the zero temperature value of the history knows about disorder, right? So disorder does play a role, but the question is, can, you know, can we get away by ignoring disorder as a part of the zero order story, understand this behavior, and then put in the disorder as an afterthought and understand why it's not exact. It may not be exactly zero, but has a non-zero. Well, it's hard to imagine that whatever is giving you this is playing a role at these temperatures, right? In setting the slope. Um, yeah. So with that, and we do like to have some things that only can't do that. 